Welcome back to our workshop on plant diversity, climate change, and conservation, the view from California. And this module is really a little tour across uh, California with uh, pictures of some of the beautiful vegetation that we enjoy here. Uh, in the last module, we talked about drivers of global climate. So just to review the major patterns of California climate, of course, uh, the influence of the ocean, the latitude, and the mountains captured in the temperature from the deserts in the south, the very hot Central Valley, the cold mountains, and the cooler North Coast. Um, so uh, you see on the left the effect of latitude, elevation, and then the coast. For rainfall, again, higher in the north, um, as you get more into that northern, that north temperate wet zone, drier in the south as you get approaching and entering the desert zone, higher in the high mountains as the water goes up and over and rains comes out of the clouds and rainfall, and higher on the west side coming off the ocean than it is on the east side in the rain shadows. So let's just dig into two other aspects of California climate, familiar to all those who live here. The first is that we live in a Mediterranean type climate. I've always wished that climatology had developed here first, and then we would call it a California type climate, which also happened to exist in the Mediterranean. But of course, the name of the climate is because it is found in the Mediterranean region of Europe and was named for that. But it is also found in five regions of the world. Um, so the Mediterranean basin, right around the right around the Mediterranean, parts of North Africa, um, the Middle East, as well as uh, Greece, Italy, France, and Spain. Um, then California, as we have it here, central Chile, the Cape region of South Africa, and west, and then Western Australia, as well as a bit of Southern Australia. And they're all at about the same latitude, and they actually have somewhat similar, somewhat different relationships to ocean currents that are a big part of setting this up. So the Mediterranean type climate is characterized by having a cool, but not freezing, you know, except unless you get into sort of Alpine Mediterranean, but let's think about coastal California. So it's cool, but rarely freezing, which is part of why gardening and agriculture are so successful here in winter. With um, the, the formal definition is more than 60% of rainfall in winter. And there's a lot of parts in California where it's even a lot more than that. Um, and then summer is very hot and dry. This diagram here is a is a very classic style of, of a climate climate diagram, and you can pull them down for different parts of the world. It's a nice quick way to compare climate. Shows rainfall in blue by month from January to December. Shows temperature in red. The two scales are actually adjusted to each other in a way that when the rainfall is higher than the temperature, more or less that means that there's going to be more rain than will be evaporated off the surface by the by the temperatures. Whereas when the red is above the blue. There's enough energy to evaporate much of the, whatever rain falls, or the plants will use it, leaving that big gap. And that's what we actually refer to as a, a climate water deficit in summer. Um, and this is seen in the other Mediterranean regions as well. California actually has the most extreme Mediterranean in the sense of the, the, one of the driest summers compared to the other um, four regions of the world. Now, we also have in California a very important influence of the ocean. And the, the basic physics here is that the ocean is just so big and water has a lot of inertia. So when you turn, put a pot of water in your stove and turn the stove on, it takes a few minutes to boil. So when you're adding energy to water, it warms up slowly and then it cools down slowly, certainly compared to the air or compared to if you put you know, a rock on that stove, the rock would get hot really fast, right? But water takes a little while to warm up. And that effect means that the ocean is like this it, it it keeps the winters milder and the summers cooler because it's not going up and down as fast. So this is what we call a maritime climate, which has been close to the ocean, which keeps, so look at San Francisco. You can see how it barely moves, you know, the, the difference between winter and summer in the minimum temperatures, which we experience at night or the maximum of temperatures during the day are quite mild. Now we move into Sacramento, move to, move to the middle of California and you see you see two things. First, like in summer, the swing between the high and the low is much bigger, right, as you get away from the ocean, and the seasonal swing from winter to summer is much bigger. So the peak summers are hotter, and then the winters are colder. And then you get to Reno, Nevada, and the winters have gotten even colder again. The summers are similar. So um, I can I can confidently share with you that that there it is very easy to confuse to, to challenge students on an exam when you ask them to keep separate a maritime climate from a Mediterranean climate. So the Mediterranean is about having the summer drought and the winter winter rainfall 
the maritime is about having those temperatures modulated so that the diurnal differences and the seasonal differences are much, uh, much less when you get near the coast, warm winters and cooler summers. So we take all these factors. There are various systems of defining climate at a global scale. This is one of them, which uses a set of abbreviations and typical names, and these are part of a, of a, a global system. But, the, but, more, but more importantly, I want you to sort of look at the map, because when we think about a climate type, we try to combine seasonality and temperature and rainfall. And this map then mirrors, um, as you'll see on the next slide, um, you know, vegetation maps, whether they are you know, mapped out, or even if you look in Google Earth and you see the major patterns. So you know, again, desert environments surrounded by a semi-arid steppe where it gets a little less dry, especially as you go up on the edges of mountains. Um, by climatic definitions and also by some of the biogeography, the San Joaquin Valley really probably always should have been considered a desert, even though it's generally been thought of as rangeland or, or agricultural lands, but really that's a desert climate in the San Joaquin, surrounded by steppe. Then we have the, the core Mediterranean climates, the greens, a, a high mountain Mediterranean at high elevation. But then this is the one that's especially important, that cool ocean leads to this distinctive climate just hugging the coast where we have the really cool summer with a lot of fog and that supports a very distinctive vegetation. So uh, different versions of this map you can see from different sources, but really capturing the major climatic zones of California. Actually, I wanna point out one favorite thing. I mean, one thing I find really fascinating is you, you come to San, the Bay Area, right? Here we have the cool climate zone right by the coast and we transition right out to the that milder summer Mediterranean, the hotter summer Mediterranean, the steppe, desert climates are right here, just east of the Bay Area. And that sets up this incredible biological gradient as well. So anyone who's done, you know, who's traveled around to different parks or done botanical work knows that the flora just changes radically. It also means as climate changes that these plants adapted to very hot conditions and animals are not far away. So that's a whole story, uh, maybe for another time, thinking about climate change and, and biogeography just here in the in our Bay Area for those who are local to the San Francisco Bay Area. So we're just going to take a tour and uh, and look at this gradient across California. Look at and and just look at the pictures and think about how the structure of the vegetation, uh, the what we call the physiognomy, which is a physical structure, changes. So you start near the coast with a very cool climate, very high rainfall, and a lot of fog, and that supports our famous redwood forests that uh, where fog is especially important. There is some data that suggests that that well in some locations fog uh, redwoods can get up to 25 percent of the water that they need over the course of a year as fog which is condensed directly onto their needles water actually move like we all are taught that water moves from the roots up the tree and out the leaves in redwoods when there's heavy fog and maybe the trees are a little water stressed the water actually comes in the needles and moves the other direction back into the twigs so the, the direction of water flow reverses in redwoods when they take in water um, from from the fog. And then of course the water drips and leads to a very rich understory, the ferns and other plants that depend on that water entry and all the animals. You move away from the coast and you don't have to move very far. And you can move you, there's both, there's some, and, and, and we can't do justice to all the richness of California vegetation here, really. We're just sort of doing a uh, jumping through some highlights. But not far away, you jump in, you get a little away from the coast, you get behind maybe the first range of mountains into a little bit of a rain shadow, and you can get into very extensive areas of chaparral, chaparral shrubland, or um, also known as sclerophyll shrubland. Sclerophyll is derived from a Greek term for a leathery leaf because of how tough and leathery the leaves are of many species. The vegetation is not very tall. The, the, winter, the winter rains fuel vegetation growth. So you can have quite you know, vigorous and lush growth. The summer dries it out. You take all that fuel, dry it out, get an ignition source. And of course, it's one of the vegetation types that's very flammable, but also a lot of adaptations to fire. So a lot of these plants have very specific adaptations in how they re-sprout or seed germination to recover from frequent fire, which has been a part of their evolutionary history. Um, Moving, uh, moving into the oak woodlands, we get into the beautiful, these are the mostly blue oak savannas, also valley oaks, with uh, large extensive stands, often of only one or two species of oak with grassland below. The open vegetation, of course, um, has been ideal for grazing. So this has been a very, uh, um, uh, these are mostly working landscapes, mostly privately owned, not as much uh, protection of a lot of the rangelands. Very important part of Native American cultures where acorns were such an important part 
uh, in, in food source along with a lot of forbs and bulbs. And these are, these are ecosystems that uh, we know uh, they're very resilient to frequent burning. And we know that Native Americans set fire very frequently and whether they were very local cultural burns for specific resources, perhaps under certain conditions, fires could have spread and gone further, whether or not that was intent we, uh, uh, of the management. Uh, and the trees, you know, because of the lack of fuels, because of the lack of br low branches, fire can spread through these grasslands at a fairly low intensity and do very little damage to the trees. And, and we see this in, in, we're seeing this in current fires, like in the wine country, that a lot of these blue oak woodlands come through, um, come through very resilient through a fire. You get into the uh, grasslands. Of course, the Central Valley was completely has been completely transformed by agriculture. There were extensive tule marshes uh, and and vegetation. We barely know what it looked like, but around the edges, all around the edges of the Central Valley, we see remaining grasslands. Um, some of them uh, with spectacular wildflower displays. Uh, this picture, some people might even know it on site, um, Shell Mount, uh, not Shell Mount, Shell Road. I'm, I don't think I'm getting their name right, down by San Luis Obispo on the way to the Carrizo Plain and in a super bloom year, just a spectacular spot. Uh, these grasslands, of course, would have been very important grazing lands for all the large mammals that um, are largely either extinct, either the Pleistocene mammals are extinct, but even like the pronghorn and things that are have uh, disappeared from most of California. These grasslands would have been very important habitats. Then we start moving up the western slope of the Sierra into mixed conifer forest. And this band, and we talked about the, you know, the the cool, te the, when you talk about the temperature and rainfall balance, there's a band in the sort of 1,000 to 2,000 meters range or 1,000 to 1,500 meters elevation where there's high rainfall, moderate temperatures, not too cool in winter. And when you look at the productivity, if you measure productivity in terms of you know the, the growth rates of the trees, there's just a peak in this mid elevation, incredibly productive um, forest, forest ecosystems. They've been very, historically very important uh, for timber production as, with these fast growing trees and the beautiful straight yellow pines, the Ponderosa, Jeffrey, sugar pine. Um, again, very fire resilient. You can see this site is burned. So if you have frequent fire in these forests and keep the understory fuels low, then fire can burn through fairly uh, and burning through on the litter and without spreading to the canopies of the trees. This is what we consider a healthy fire regime in a lot of Sierra Nevada forests. Unfortunately, with the lack of the fire suppression and the buildup of small trees and the buildup of dead branches on the what we call ladder fuels, a lot of what might have been these smaller fires have been with changing climate and then changing forest practice have become these catastrophic fires we're seeing as the fire spreads to the canopy and then with wind uh, with the wind blowing spreads across large landscapes so what is considered a healthy fire regime in the sierra nevada a very fire adapted system what we're seeing now most people the vast majority of fire ecologists are in agreement is far outside the historical range of how these systems would have burned with a lot of concern uh, for the consequences in terms of type conversion, uh, biodiversity, of course, timber production, habitat, and then home loss, uh, devastating home losses for communities who live in these mountains. We get to the high Alpine. Um, this is the desolation wilderness west of Lake Tahoe, um, even, even higher, more spectacular areas in the Southern Sierra. And now we've gotten, uh, and two things are going on here. It's very cold, so very low productivity and a very short growing season uh, after the snow melts. But remember also that these areas were all glaciated. So now it's only been 14,000, 15,000 years. And under those cold temperatures, that's not much time for soil to develop. So the combination of the climate with, with low or no soil on those big granite outcrops like, like here just means that you know the climate alone could probably support a somewhat more robust vegetation if there was soil there, but all the soil was scraped off by the glaciers and that takes uh, thousands or if not tens of thousands of, year, of years to build up a deep, uh, a deep soil ecosystem supporting the vegetation. And we go over the mountains and I'm, I'm not doing justice to the drier parts of the state. I spend more time on um, this side of the mountains. The, there's of course a huge range of habitats in the desert. I'm just ending our, our transect here. <clears throat> um, Actually, down near no, down, down near um, the Joshua Tree, there's Ocotillo here. So now we have a whole variety, and this is an interesting phenomenon ecologically that 
as water becomes the dominant, you know, sort of the lack of water becomes the dominant ecological factor, what we see is a great diversity of ways of dealing with water. So whether you have succulent plants or the okotia, which pops out leaves and flowers when it rains, <clears throat> or phreatophytes like, like the sycamores with deep roots going down to groundwater or the annuals that just pop up. So um, a, a huge variety of different ways of dealing with this very, um, really very stressful environment, just in terms of high, high temperatures and lack of water. I'm putting this in context. Uh, the Conservation International did this work to map out biodiversity hotspots of the world. And California sits among about a couple dozen uh, hotspots as shown on the map here, <clears throat> excuse me. And the way they define this is extraordinary places that harbor vast numbers of plant and animal species found nowhere else and all are heavily threatened by habitat loss and degradation. And it's really important to emphasize this first part, the plant and animal species found nowhere else. It depends on whether you're counting species or subspecies, but you know, California has 5,000 native plants, maybe six and a half to 7,000 when you count the subspecies. But certainly at that species level, more than half uh, or about half, um, I think it's a little more than half, are endemic, found nowhere else in the world. And the, the percent of species that are unique only to California or to the California floristic province, some spill into a little bit of Baja or Oregon, but we still count them in the floristic province, speaks to that Mediterranean climate and how special the climate is. So given that you have special adaptations to a special climate, then a lot of the species are gonna be unique to that region. And then to repeat where we started, California floristic province, the Chilean, uh, the, 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 the winter rain, Mediterranean climate part of Chile with a unique Chilean flora, the Cape floristic region, Mediterranean Basin, and then Southwest Australia are those five Mediterranean regions. I am unapologetically focusing on plants, not only for uh, the audience I'm speaking to here, connected to our Jepson herbarium, but I'm a plant ecologist, but also the plants form the environment, the habitat, the template, the foundation, the food for all the other animals. So of course, the animal biodiversity is incredibly important. How animals respond to or are affected by biodiversity is very important, but I will be focusing on continuing to focus on plants throughout these discussions. So we'll wrap up there, that uh, quick tour of California ecosystems. <laughs>